Good, good morning. <laughs> Uh, to begin uh, this morning, let me recall some of the results of yesterday. Uh, you remember that we, we uh, were working on the acoustics of reactive flows, and um, we started again with the basic equations, uh, but this time with the source term. And the source term is due to the heat release fluctuations that are present in, uh, in combustion. So this appear in the equation for uh, the entropy, and we can accommodate that uh, and write down a set of equations <coughs> that accounts for these uh, fluctuations. And uh, this went like that, and we finally get uh, a wave equation, but now this wave equation has a source term. The source term corresponds, reflects the, the fluctuations in heat release rate uh, that, are, uh, that appear. And you can see that the source term is the time derivative of the heat release rate fluctuations. So you have here an equation which has, on the left, it's the wave equation. On the right, it's the source of noise. It's the source of pressure fluctuations in the, in the field. Uh, from that, also, we, we derived a, um, a balance well, we, we looked at the case of compact flames uh, because very often the wavelength is much larger than the size of the flame. So you can bring the flame to something very compact compared to the wavelengths. And we tried to see how uh, the velocity on the upstream and downstream side are related. And uh, we found that you could write this expression where f is the transfer function. So we introduced this transfer function, f of omega, that is equal to q dot 1 divided by q dot bar, v prime divided v bar. So uh, the input, the flame is considered uh, more or less like a system. So you have, on the input, you have the, uh, the velocity v prime. And on the output, you have, let's write it Q, Q, Q prime. This is the Q prime at the output. And so you characterize this system by its transfer function. And of course, one has to measure that transfer function or calculate the transfer function or even do the analysis to get the transfer function. And uh, another uh, point that we did yesterday was to uh, uh, to use that expression and, uh, and calculate the instability of a flame located in a duct. We considered the duct with closed ends on both sides, and we found out that the uh, imaginary part of the angular frequency uh, was proportional to this, uh, the gain of the transfer function multiplied by the sinus of the phase. And uh, we found that this quantity was positive when phi was between, uh, so there is perhaps a minus sign here, uh, when, the, when phi was between pi and 2 pi, uh, this makes a positive, uh, th there are other terms, but we finally, it was more, more or less like that. So, uh, so this gives you an idea of, what are the stability bands? Where, where, where is the flame stable or unstable? Another point that we did yesterday was to try to get a, a balance of acoustic energy in the system. And uh, this balance takes the form, the very standard form of a conservation equation, where you have here E is the uh, energy density, the acoustic energy density. F is the flux, that's a vector. Not to be confused with this f. I'm sorry, it's the same notation, but this is a vector. That, that's a, uh, uh, this is a, a flux of uh, acoustic energy. And, uh, and the expressions of these two quantities are, uh, are uh, as follows. E is equal to 1 over 1 half P1 square over rho 0 C square plus 1 half. So this is the elastic energy. 
and this is the kinetic energy in the acoustic wave, and the flux F is equal to P1 V1. And it's a vector. It goes in the same direction as the, the velocity uh, associated with the acoustic wave. And also, on the, on the right-hand side, we have a term which represents the, the source of acoustic energy in the system. And if this term is positive, then E might increase. So, uh, so the source is here. And in addition, I explained that uh, there is damping in the system. All systems are damped. But uh, it's less easy to get the damping. At least, it's not very easy to get it uh, from theoretical arguments. It's easier to measure. I told you how we, we measured that. So finally, the, uh, the balance of acoustic energy writes like that. You have a source term, which is based on these. It's the, uh, the, the, the average over a cycle. This is a, an equation which is written for, uh, the, uh, the, uh, for all these quantities averaged over one cycle. You have a source, which is proportional to this P1 Q, uh, Q dot 1. And you have a damping, which is in the system. And of course, is, if this is positive, you might have, of course, there are also fluxes that can uh, eliminate some of the acoustic energy. But s let's assume that these fluxes are very small. Then E will grow if this is greater than the damping. And uh, uh, Rayleigh already did uh, uh, develop this criterion, indicating that if you want to have an instability in a flame, you need to have pressure and heat release in phase so that this term is positive. So this is called the Rayleigh criterion. All right, so that was uh, about just a, uh, to, to tell you again what we, we had been doing. So all this was done yesterday. Uh, we also looked at uh, various aspects in terms of uh, noise radiated by flames. And, uh, and today now we are going to continue our studies of instability by using this sensitive time lag model. So let's stop that. So this, uh, this modeling was initiated in the, the early days of uh, uh, developing uh, rockets. Uh, there were many failures. Uh, a number of rockets uh, just failed uh, because mainly in, 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 in many cases because of combustion instability. Actually, the Saturn V rocket engine uh, was uh, very difficult to finally uh, obtain a, a version that would be stable. Uh, it took a lot of testing. This is uh, recounted in a paper by Vigor Yang. He, he, has, uh, he tells the story of how uh, uh, difficult it was to obtain a, a, an engine which was stable, which didn't show instabilities. Many testing, a lot of money was there. Uh, the program, uh, this, uh, this program to go to the moon uh, was at a stop during uh, about more than a year because of these uh, uh, problems, because of combustion instability problems. Finally, they, they found the, the way and uh, there was no problem uh, uh, afterwards. So uh, at that time, uh, people uh, were interested in, in trying to understand the, the process and uh, they uh, developed this sensitive time lag theory. Uh, and what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about that, but there is much more literature you can... So this is literature in the 1950s. Uh, was developed in particular by Luigi Crocco, so uh, Luigi Crocco was a famous professor in, in Princeton. Uh, he did many other things. Uh, he worked on boundary layers. He worked on uh, uh, compressible flows. He, he did many, many things. And uh, he was one of the users and the developers of this sensitive time lag. And as we are in Princeton, it's normal to tell you a little bit about the sensitive time lag theory. It's, it's also interesting as a theory. Uh, also, uh, uh, Tsien. Tsien was also uh, an important uh, 
developer of uh, these concepts. And uh, Tsien later on, he, he, he was in the, a professor at Caltech and le later on had to leave to go to China. And uh, he was the father of the Chinese space program at the time. And my advisor, Frank Marble, also in those days was working with Tsien and uh, was using these uh, sensitive time lag uh, methods as well. So, uh, the idea is as follows. Uh, you examine here a rocket engine, but what we say here can be used also in more standard combustion situations. So you have reactants getting in in this rocket. Uh, you have a flame here, and burnt gases are produced by the flame. Let's designate the mass flow of burnt gases m dot b of t. Now this mass of burnt gases at time t is due to the mass of injected gases at time t minus tau because what you inject will take a time to burn. It, the, this is based on mixing, it based uh, if you have liquid propellants they will have to vaporize and it takes a time and this time lag is tau. And what you, what you burn at time t was injected at time t minus tau, but uh, uh, if you look at the amount that, that, that is here, m dot b times dt, uh, this amount was uh, injected between time uh, t minus tau and time t minus tau uh, plus dt minus tau. So in fact, what you have here is that uh, m, m dot of b dt is equal m dot of i t minus tau at time uh, uh, delayed by tau and dt minus tau. If tau is constant, if this time uh, lag is constant, uh, nothing happens here. You have just m, m dot of b is equal to m dot of i of t minus tau. But uh, if tau is not constant, if it depends on the parameters that uh, are present in the, in the chamber, then you have to, to, de to, to derive this expression. What is dt minus, uh, over d tau? What is the rate of change of this time lag? This is why it's sensitive, because it's sensitive to the state in the chamber. So uh, this is the basic expression that we start with. And um, what, we, what we have to do is actually to calculate d tau over dt. And the, the, the general idea is to say what, uh, how does this time lag develop? Uh, the, the time lag develops as follows. You, you have, for example, a vaporization process. To vaporize droplets, let's assume that you, you have to give a, a certain amount of heat to the droplets. Uh, this heat will depend on the pressure, the temperature of the gases, and uh, you have to accumulate a sufficient amount of heat uh, so that the droplets will vaporize. And let's assume that this is some sort of constant, that you need to give this amount of heat to the droplets. There is a, lo uh, a lot of uh, phenomenology here. So, uh, this is what you can write. You can say uh, the droplets will vaporize, it will take a time tau, and uh, you have to accumulate a sufficient amount of uh, heat into these droplets so that th they finally vaporize. So this is one way to write it, but uh, this is not practical. What we can do is to derive that as a function of time, and if you derive this as a function of time, you can write that f of p of t. So the upper boundary uh, is just uh, when you derive t is 1. So b, uh, f of t, uh, p of t and tg of t. All right. And then the lower boundary when we take the derivative of, uh, so, so this is the function at the lower boundary, f of p of t minus tau and tg of t minus tau. And, uh, and, and this is multiplied by the derivative of the, of the lower boundary, b of t, this boundary, t minus tau. So it makes 1 minus d tau over dt. 
and all this is equal to zero because here you have assumed that it's a constant. So in fact now this, equations, this equation will be able to give you d tau over dt. So d tau over dt can be extracted from this expression. And uh, this is what is done here. You see, you write that equation. This is at the top. And then you, you expand each of these two terms. You see this. What we'll assume is that d tau over dt is not very large. So it's a, a first order expansion that we do here. We assume that tau is not so big. And so uh, we, we make an expansion of this term. We make an expansion of that term. And we introduce that in here. And if you do the, uh, the calculations, uh, they are, I've, I've done it yesterday night, but I'm, you can do them by yourself. You can persuade yourself that you have this expression coming out. So what comes out is as follows. The uh, the tau by dt. So this, this is the, uh, the rate of change of the time lag will be a function of so there is a, a parameter, uh, a, a first coefficient, d log f by d log p. So it's the sensitivity of f with respect to the pressure multiplied by p of t minus tau minus p of t divided by p bar. p bar is the pressure in the chamber. And then you have a second term if the, uh, if the temperature is changing as well. If, uh, if the function f is a function of the temperature, log f, and this time it's by d log p, uh, tg, the gas temperature. And here we have um, uh, tg t minus tau minus tg of t. And this uh, is like that. So we have these two terms. Uh, coming out. Uh, the derivation is, is rather simple, but I, I'm not going to do it. Just you get that, that expression. And let's assume for the moment to simplify things that this term is small, that, uh, there is a, that the temperature Tg is essentially constant uh, through all the process, just to simplify things. So, uh, so this term will, will be neglected. So basically what you get, and this is just the coefficient that we will call n. And so finally, d tau over dt appears in the form n. This is called an interaction index that is not quite known. It's, a, it's just an index, but we, we can work with things which are not known, but as parameters. This is a parameter multiplied by p of t minus tau minus p of t divided by p bar. So, uh, so this, gives you, uh, this gives you an expression of this sensitive time lag uh, derivative, this derivative with respect to time uh, that, that we were looking for. All right, yes. F is a, you see, it's, you can represent that as a function that, uh, that describes, you see, uh, you, the, let, let me uh, drink some water here. Yes, you see F is the, the heat that is integrated, that when you integrate this heat uh, flux to the droplets, will finally vaporize your droplets. One of the, wh why, why, is it, why is there a time lag? It's because the propellants are uh, liquid and finally they become gas. So if the droplets are very small, uh, they vaporize rather fast. If they are big, it's slower. So, but you need to, to bring in some heat to vaporize the droplets. So you express that. It's, a, it's a very mechanistic yeah, here. You don't know exactly what F is. It's just to, to, uh, to, to find a way to get this uh, d tau over dt. 
And uh, w what you don't know is this, this uh, derivative, you know, d, d log f of uh, d log p. This can be written perhaps in a more explicit form. It's uh, df by dp, and you have here p bar and f, okay? So that's it. So at the value of uh, p and tg, uh, you, you calculate, but you don't know that. So you call it n, and n is the interaction index. And then you, you will change n. For example, if there is no interaction, if nothing happened, n is zero, d tau by dt is zero. But if n is something, then you have this expression coming in, and we are going to see how, how we use it, okay? So now, uh, now it, it is possible to come back to this expression that we derived initially. The expression was, uh, was as follows. It's there. m dot b of t is equal to m dot uh, i times uh, of t minus tau times 1 minus d tau by dt. And what we are going to do is to, uh, to introduce d tau by dt that, that was obtained. So d tau by dt is equal to n, this interaction index, p of t minus tau minus p of t divided by p bar. Of course, all of that is to derive an equation that will give you the dynamics of this system. Uh, what we do is we, we are going to consider fluctuations of the, of the various quantities with respect to a mean value. So what the mean value is m dot bar. This is the, just the mass flux that goes on in this rocket. So uh, we can write m dot b is equal to m dot bar plus a certain fluctuation m prime dot bar, m, m prime dot b. And we can write also m dot i is equal to m dot bar, the mean, plus a fluctuation here, right, like that. If you do that, you get this expression. It's very simple. You, uh, you, you replace, you take these two expressions, you put them into these two relations, in this relation here, you divide by the, the, uh, the average, the, uh, the mean m dot, m dot bar, and you get m dot, pri m dot prime b divided by m dot bar um, is equal to uh, m dot pri prime i t minus tau divided by m dot bar and, uh, and d tau minus dt. So, so now uh, it's simple. You see the fluctuation, the relative fluctuation of the burnt gases is equal to relative fluctuation of fresh reactants at time t minus tau. And in addition, we have this term d tau by dt. So d tau by dt, we know the expression. Uh, if, for example, uh, this quantity here, if you uh, inject uh, reactants at a continuous and there is no fluctuation, if the, the injectors are, have a very high impedance so they don't respond to any pressure fluctuation in the chamber, this is zero. And so you have just m dot b and dot, the relative fluctuation of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, mass flow rate is equal to minus d tau by dt. So uh, this is the case that is shown at the bottom here. Is it okay? Do you follow me? Yeah, in, in essence, yes. So now, uh, it, it's possible to actually interpret that uh, in terms of uh, uh, heat release. 
up to now we have essentially spoken about uh, the mass flow rate of burnt gases and so on, but uh, it is possible actually to say that you see the, the heat release is of course proportional, the relative heat release is proportional to this uh, burnt gas uh, uh, relative uh, fluctuation. You can write down that Q prime dot over Q bar, Q, Q dot bar <laughs> is, uh, is proportional to M prime B divided by M bar. And, uh, and so uh, you, you see immediately that this is minus d tau by dt. And we can write that as n p of t minus p of t minus tau divided by p bar. So that's a model. That's, uh, it gives you a, uh, an idea of what the pressure will do in terms of heat release fluctuation, relative heat release fluctuation. Uh, it has often been used, what, what has often been used is to replace this whole thing here by something else, by, by saying, well, it's proportional to the velocity fluctuations, uh, u prime divided by u bar. So it looks very much at, at time t minus tau. So uh, sometimes, you see, this, this is the original sensitive time lag theory. This is something that you can also use. You can imagine that it's the velocity fluctuations which produce the heat release fluctuations. We've seen examples of that uh, previously. But let's continue with the original. So this in fact, this corresponds to saying that we have a transfer function, and this transfer function is just, you see, when you, when you write q dot prime divided by q dot bar, like that, it means that the transfer function f of omega is just a constant. So the gain is a constant. This is the gain. And the phase is i to i omega tau. So the phase it, it corresponds to a time lag. So basically, uh, if you use something like that, it, it is as if the transfer function was constant in terms of gain and a linear phase. If I plot that, it would be like that. This is the gain. It would be n. So the gain would be the same for all frequencies. And the phase would be like that. So this, the fact that it's linear with respect to uh, frequency corresponds to a, a constant um, time lag. But let's, let's continue with this. So now uh, we have to, this is not enough, we have to, to do a balance in, uh, in the rocket. And uh, what we can do is to use this expression here to obtain a dynamical balance for the rocket engine. So this is done now. The idea is that we, we can base the balance on a, on a conservation of mass. So what happens in the rocket? We have, a, uh, we have a volume here. Uh, the flame is somewhere here. We produce M dot B here, burnt gases. And of course, gases are ejected through the nozzle. nozzle and we call them M point E. So the, uh, the balance of mass in the rocket is that the mass of gas that is in the rocket would be produced by M dot B of T. And, and this will, this indicates that some of it is going out. And now we have to use expression of that kind to examine this as a, uh, uh, as a function of time. And of course, we have also to get an expression for uh, what is being exhausted. So this is done here. 
So what we do is we assume that uh, there is a, a permanent uh, a flow of, uh, of gases inside the rocket. And, uh, and so in the mean, m dot b of t is equal to m dot uh, bar and uh, m dot, so in the mean, all of these quantities are the same. It's the, you are in a steady state, m dot bar. Uh, it is also interesting to use the, uh, the residence time. We will call that theta g. And the residence time is the mass of gas that you have at, the, at a given moment inside this volume divided by the, the gas, the, the, the mass that is being exhausted, m dot bar. You see, this, this is the, the amount of time that the gases reside, stay inside the rocket thrust chamber. So you have this, uh, this time. And uh, this is the residence time. And what you see is that we can write that expression, the, the expression of, for, the, uh, uh, for the, uh, that expression there, we can write it in terms of, uh, of fluctuations instead of ke keeping the, uh, the steady state inside, we, we look at the fluctuations. So, um, you introduce this um, um, oh, let's, uh, we start from that equation and we write down each of these terms. So dmg bar plus mg prime, these are the fluctuations, divided by dt. And here we have m dot b bar plus m prime b bar minus m, m dot e, but this is the same as this, minus m prime e. And we can, uh, we can take this out, these are equal, and also we can divide by uh, m dot bar, so we have here d of m prime g divided by dt, one over m bar here. And, um, and on this side, we have m prime b minus m prime e primes. It's simple, it's uh, nothing fancy here, it's only a little complicated in terms of notations. And it's interesting, oh, yeah, and we divided by m, m prime. And uh, it's useful to, to actually use dimensionless quantities. So the dimensionless quantities are, are mu b is m prime b divided by M, M bar and uh, mu e is M prime e divided by M bar. Okay, so, uh, so now this equation, finally, we also, it's interesting to put mg here, the quantity of gas that is in the chamber. And so uh, if we do that, we have to divide by mg bar. So finally, everything is written in terms of uh, relative fluctuations. And you see that the, the, uh, the residence time is now coming into this equation. And of course, this residence time is important in many applications, you, you know that. So d by dt of m prime g, 
divided by m bar g. It's a first order differential equation that we are going to get here. Uh, what is uh, special here is that there is a time lag. And uh, we have now mu, mu b minus mu e. So this is, this is finally the balance of mass for the fluctuations. And these fluctuations are written here as uh, relative fluctuations. Theta g, again, represents the, the average residence time. And, uh, and then you, it is possible, actually, to use a, a dimensionless time. So that is, let's, uh, let's consider. So this time is, uh, is, uh, is denoted z. Uh, it's not such a nice notation for a time, but that's it. Uh, I, I use the notations of the uh, um, initial papers in this field. So it's t divided by tau g. So finally, this, uh, this equation can be written d by dz of the fluctuation, the relative fluctuation of gases inside the chamber. And this is equal to the relative fluctuations of burned gases minus the ejected gases. So we could almost write that from the start without all these technical steps. Not quite. So anyway, it, it shows that the presence of this uh, uh, resonance time. Uh, now, uh, what remains to be done is to actually uh, express each of these terms. And we know that, uh, so one of them is this m, m prime b over m bar, which is here. And uh, so, so the first term of this, of this expression Uh, so this was when, when we have no changes in the injection, but when we, when we have uh, also changes in the injection, you remember that m dot, b, m, m dot prime b divided by m, m dot bar was equal to m prime, m dot prime i, what is injected at t minus tau divided by m dot bar plus n p of t minus p of t minus tau, and all of that divided by p bar. <laughs> OK, so this is what we are going to plug. This is actually mu b. This is mu b. And um, to make it also for the pressure here, instead of using the pressure, we use phi, which is the uh, p of t divided by p bar. So we use also a, uh, the, uh, in fact, the, the pressure fluctuation uh, divided by p bar. So, uh, so this explains that d by dt, d by dz now of m prime g divided by m bar g is equal to, first of all, n times phi of z minus phi <coughs> of z minus tau minus, uh, now it's a tau, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, a, a tau is now, uh, it's, it's a, um, the original tau has been divided by, uh, by tau g. So all of uh, the tau that is here is now uh, reduced by the, uh, by the uh, um, resonance time, OK? So this is the first term. And we have the second term, which is uh, mu prime i. So mu i of z minus tau. So this is. The injection, what happens when you, when you inject uh, the fresh stream, and then we have the, what, what goes out, which is mu, mu e of z. So the, uh, 
the balance that we now have to, to study is this one. And of course, we have to say something about uh, what happens to this mass of gas. So what is the mass of gas in the, in the rocket? And what is its relation with the pressure? So inside this uh, engine, mg is equal to sum of rho dv over the volume of the rocket, of the thrust chamber. And this is also equal to p over rtg dv. And, uh, and if we assume that Tg is essentially constant, that's what we did. We assume that the burnt gases have a temperature which is essentially constant. This can be uh, represent. And if we assume that the pressure in the whole thrust chamber is the same everywhere, we are in the low frequency range. We look at uh, fluctuations which are uh, occurring in the whole thrust chamber. Uh, we find out that uh, mg is just uh, p, the, the current p of t divided by something which is constant, rtg, uh, multiplied by the volume v, that's it. And so m prime g over m bar g will be just p prime over p bar, which is phi. So on the right-hand side now, we have just d phi by dz on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have n times phi of z minus phi of z minus tau. Again, this tau is measured in terms of residence time. And then we have the incoming flow. And then we have what goes out from the nozzle. So we, we still have to express that. So what, what comes out from the nozzle? You know, the nozzle is choked. And so the mass flow rate through the nozzle is proportional to the stagnation pressure. But let's assume that the velocities inside the chamber are small. So basically, the, the mass flow rate is proportional. The mass flow rate uh, uh, m dot e is proportional to the pressure divided by the square root of the temperature. The, the stagnation temperature, but here again we we consider that the stagnation temperature is is constant. The, the velocities are small in the thrust chamber. They are very large in the in the nozzle. They can reach 4,000 meters per second as you eject, but inside it's it doesn't go too fast. So uh, if Tg is constant, we see that uh, m dot e prime divided by m dot bar will be p prime divided by p bar. And so we can say that this is equal to phi. So, uh, so here we have just a, a term. So finally, you see the, the reasoning here. Uh, so finally, we have, uh, yeah, this is it. And, and finally, we get that. So the final equation is written here. Sorry for the, the amount of time that I took to derive that. Uh, I think you can redo it by yourself again if you want. It's, it's a, an exercise to, to show how we do, uh, uh, how we look at a problem and, uh, and start from the basic uh, uh, conservation and finally get a dynamic equation. So the, what, what is this equation? Let, let's consider that equation by assuming that mu i is, con, is zero. Uh, let's consider that the, 
the, the upstream manifold does not respond to anything. So it's it, uh, mu i, we assume here for simplicity, but of course all of that has been studied, you know. Uh, mu i of z is equal to zero. No fluctuation, you, you just put in more mass and that's it. So the equation to study is d phi by dz is equal to n times phi of z minus phi of z minus tau. Uh, and then we have minus phi of z. So this is the differential equation. Phi is the relative fluctuation of pressure. And of course, this is of interest, directly of interest. So we have now a, a nice equation to study. You see the, uh, after all this analysis, uh, this can be, we can put all the terms on the same side and you can go to your computer and calculate this expression because, but uh, you see the integration is a little more tricky because this is a system with a time lag. So what is different from the standard ordinary differential equations is that here you have a time lag. But there are uh, uh, integrators for, for such uh, equations. So you can actually directly work numerically. So this is the basic equation for low frequency instability of rocket engines, provided that the temperature is assumed constant, that there is a, a sensitive time lag. We don't know the parameter n, but we are going to discuss the stability of this system in terms of n, n will be a parameter. We have also the time lag, tau, which is not very well known. And of course, this is the other parameter. This parameter is reduced by the, uh, by the uh, uh, residence time inside the chamber. So you have all the parameters here. And uh, if you want one way to, to study that is to, uh, to use a Laplace transform. That is, it's a first order differential equation. You can use either the Laplace transform or just say phi is equal a, a constant, e to the s, z. And, and now all, the whole uh, problem is to find s. Is, is s going to be, is going to have a real part positive? Then the, the, the system will be unstable. If s is negative, it will be stable. So you look for the roots of the equation that you get by, uh, by inputting this expression. And uh, so what is the, uh, what kind of expression do we get here if we, if we plug in this, this, uh, this form? You assume that phi is equal to a times e to the s of z. So d phi by dz is a s e to the s z. So we have d phi by dz. So we have uh, a s e to the s z. Then we have. Um, uh, plus one or one minus n a e s z uh, plus n uh, phi of of z minus tau. So this will make a s e to the s uh, z minus tau. And, um, and that's it. So a number of things are going away. And uh, this one is going away as well. So what we have here is S plus one minus N plus N e to the minus S T tau is equal to zero.
So now, um, one may solve that equation. This is a characteristic equation. You write down S as a real part and imaginary part. You obtain two, two equations, which are written here. And uh, you can study the situation where lambda, you see S is equal to 0. This is the boundary between stable and unstable. When S is equal to 0, when, when the real part of S is equal to 0, you are just neutrally stable. It's an oscillation. So uh, this curve is given by this expression here. You see you have this omega is the, uh, the imaginary part. So this is the, fr the frequency. Tau is, this, um, is the time lag. Um, what, we, what we have here is the curve. This uh, describes the curve separating stable and unstable regions. Uh, and uh, what, you, what you find out very rapidly is that n has to be bigger than one half. So if n, if the interaction index is smaller than one half, uh, the system is stable. There is no instability. But if, uh, if um, n is bigger than one half, this is because you, you need this condition. Omega is a real number. So uh, if n is bigger than one half, you may be unstable. And then the curve itself looks like that. So uh, you have a, uh, the stability band. You see the, uh, the region above that curve. This is the curve which separates the regions of instability and the region of stability. So uh, if you are at the, if omega tau is equal to pi and n is above 1 half, you are in the unstable region and this will oscillate. And if you do computer calculations, they, they will show a growth of instability. So this, this tells you what you can do with such models. But of course, you don't know the interaction index. But it tells you that if the interaction is sufficiently strong, then instability occurs. So uh, much of the discussion of all the 1950s to the 70s and so on was based on this sort of arguments, much of that. So this is why it's important to to look at, uh, it's, it's a little bit historical, but it's also, it tells you how to uh, take a problem and, uh, and start uh, working on it. Do you have any questions here? Yes. Uh, what we studied here is a, a thrust chamber in which you have a, a pressure which is homogeneous, which, will, which may oscillate around the mean value. And what we did is write down an equation for the pressure. So it's not a spatial pressure. This is, uh, you see, it's, the pressure is only a, a function of time here. There is no space uh, dependence here. It's the pressure in the chamber. And uh, what we found is that this pressure, of course, what happens is suppose the, uh, n is equal to zero. So this whole term here disappears. So d phi by dz is equal to zero, or d phi by dz might be a function of what you have at the injection. But if this is zero as well, d phi by dz will be just uh, given by uh, this term here minus phi, and you see that it's decaying. So it's a, in, in the case of uh, when there is nothing taking place between combustion and uh, the pressure, uh, then the system has a natural decay due to the fact that you, you have gases coming out here. So you have d phi by dz is equal to minus phi. So that's a, it's an exponential decay. And the, and the decay is, is uh, the time of decay is, is, the, is the residence time. You see, the, uh, because uh, you, you see if this term is zero, so if there is no interaction, phi will be e to the minus z. And z is e to the minus 
t over tau g. So, um, so the system, because of the nozzle, there is a, a damping directly due to this nozzle. And the, the damping time is equal to the uh, residence time in the system. If now you put a, uh, this, uh, this sensitive time lag, if you have this uh, time lag and the sensitivity to the pressure, so on, uh, then you get this term. So if n is sufficient, you, you need at least uh, an n of one half, then you can have low frequency oscillations in this uh, engine. Yes? And there's low fre frequency oscillation that destroy your, destroy your turbine engine? Yeah, uh, well, uh, the most destructive in rocket engines are high frequency oscillations. Uh, but uh, the low frequency can really perturb. You, you know, there are many possibilities. One of them is at the very low frequency, the, uh, the thrust can be uh, uh, oscillatory. The, the structures are fairly elastic, so they start uh, doing a, a vibration. The manifolds then will change the, uh, react the propellant mass fluxes going into the chamber. And if the system is, uh, is not well conceived, this will give a pogo effect. You know, you, you know the pogo, you know the pogo uh, system? You jump on a, uh, on, a, uh, on a spring, you know, there is a platform on a spring, and you start uh, jumping around like that, so the rocket does that. So this is the pogo instability. But then you have low frequency instabilities, this described by these expressions here. And then you have high frequency instabilities, which are the most dangerous, which uh, are more or less what we are going to explain in the, in the last lectures on, uh, on Friday. All right, let's stop for until 10 and relax a little.